Well, I, I don't think it's been a secret to uh, those of you that have been with us week by week that this is um, out of the three year cycle that we worship with, our, my least favorite year out of our three years. Uh, whether you know it or not, I think many of you do, uh, we travel through the year uh, using one gospel. Uh, this year it's the Gospel of Matthew. Next year, Mark. Of course, the third year is Luke. And the Gospel of John is so significant that we fit it in throughout the year, every year. And so, uh, in a three-year cycle, we'll read over 95% of the, all four Gospels in our worship. Now, Matthew is my least favorite of the three years. And I don't know if you've noticed that I have avoided preaching on Matthew uh, as we cut the stories that we come into the summer and fall because it, Matthew's church was under such severe persecution. The temple, uh, and indeed all of Jerusalem, had been utterly destroyed. The Jewish people were having a crisis of identity. They didn't know whether they were going to survive. And a small section of them began to follow this man called Jesus and worship Jesus as God's Son. And this small group comes under severe persecution. And this is the church that the Gospel of Matthew comes from. And so Matthew is always very sharp, very strident, if you read, uh, a, a perfectly normal parable. The wedding feast, where the man throws a wedding feast, invites everybody, and the people that he invites can't come. So he opens the door and says, anybody that wants to come, I don't care who you are, just come on in. In Luke, in Mark, it's a beautiful parable. In Matthew, last week, does anybody remember? It's a king and his son, and the son gets killed, and the king sends armies and like burns down the city, and this poor guy actually shows up, but he's not dressed right. Kind of sounds like me everywhere. You know, he shows up, he's not dressed right, and they throw him out the door, and there's wailing and gnashing of teeth outside. That's roughly homecoming last night. Uh, you know, just, just, you know, it's a, you know, very, very strident. Because in the church, uh, in Matthew's world, you had to know that Jesus was true, or he wasn't. You were staking, they were staking their lives on the person of Jesus and what he said. Isn't it ironic? Do you find it ironic that uh, this is the world? As much as I hate to admit it, this is the world that we are living in right now. We're going back to Matthew's time right now. It's the most uncomfortable gospel for me, but it's the most appropriate. When I read this story today, I think about, I don't think I've ever told you, I grew up in a uh, parish day school in Tampa, Florida, St. Mary's Episcopal Day School. And uh, this is a time, does anybody remember a time in the church when acolyting was a privilege? You had to apply, there were so many kids that wanted to be up on the altar. And so I was about eight years old. And I had applied to be an acolyte. I watched the women on Sundays, and before, we had chapel five days a week in the school. Watch the women, as they do now, so beautifully and lovingly handle everything on the altar. I saw that almost every single week. I saw the priest that I grew up with, one of the most loving men I'd ever met, handle and pray, and just he could even convey God's love without speaking. Such a powerful man. And I watched him behind the altar, and I got this sense, I, it was the word reverence, although nobody knew that word when you're eight years old, that there was something special and different about these things in this place. And I was watching it day after day. One day, I was taking a note to this priest during lunch at the school. And I was walking along the back of our church, and here were two big guys up in the front. They were eighth graders. They were humongous. They were so big and so intimidating, they played football. Now, I was, at hard to believe, one of the smallest kids you've ever seen. And like every Scottish kid, I had a big mouth with nothing to back it up. And like every good Scotsman, 
I was learning that the way to live was ready, fire, aim. And these two big kids were up in the front of the church around the altar and they were laughing. They were swaggering, their shoulders were bouncing. And one of them took the candlestick up on the altar and knocked it over and the other one laughed. Now, I don't know if I can convey as an eight-year-old how disturbing that picture was. I've never seen anybody treat anything on the altar violently. And I'd never had the feeling that rose up inside of me at that moment. I would call it righteous indignation now, but that's too fancy a word. I was furious. And my eight-year-old mouth opened up with nothing to back this up from the back of the church. And I said, stop! Put that down! And this behemoth of an eighth grade boy turned around and his muscles were hanging up. <laughs> And he said, Keith, is that you? And, I, you know, once that comes out, it ain't going back in. And I pulled myself up and I said, and I didn't answer who it was, and I said, that belongs to God and you don't touch it. I just want to highlight moments in my life. Up until I forgot how fast an eighth grade boy could close the distance right down the main aisle of the church. And these two boys were immediately in the back, in my face, my shoulders were pressed up against the back of the church. There was wooden things, I still remember what it felt like. They got this far in my face, and, and they roughed me up physically. That happened a lot when I was a kid. And they left laughing, and I was crying on the ground. And wouldn't you know at that moment, our priest was going to lunch, and he walked through the church, and he saw me in a heap in the back. It's one of the signature moments of my life in the church. This kind man walked to the back, and this is at a time when priests could actually walk towards a kid, and it was okay. And he knelt down, and he said, Brooks, what happened? I was crying, and I pointed towards the altar. And he turned and he looked up at the altar and he saw the candlestick down. And he said, oh, did someone do that? And I nodded. He said, did you try to stop them? And I nodded. He said, oh. And he took these incredibly warm, loving hands, not threatening hands. He took my shoulders, not hard, and he got my shirt right. And I remember him physically kind of lifting me up. And he looked me right in the eye and he said, thank you for standing up for God. And then he said, we know something that they don't know. He never asked who they were. He said, we know something that they don't know. We know how much God stands up for us. That's all he said. And he stood up, and he helped me up. And from that moment on, I have to say, I have had such a profound respect for the things of God around an altar, that it really is sacred space. And I've never forgot that image. He didn't preach a sermon, he didn't need to. He stood up for God, and he stood me right up as well. And for the first time in my life, I had a sense of what it's like to stand up for something that I believe so deeply in. Do you remember those moments in your life? A great Anglican bishop said, right before the year 2000, Christian S won't make it in the new money. There really isn't such a thing, he said, as a Christian S. One has to decide whether we follow Christ or whether we don't. These men that trapped Jesus in the reading today were trying to force him. They were expert teachers. They were sent by the Pharisees to have Jesus say something stupid. To have the crowds turn against him as his popularity is rising. 
they come into his face. They show him a coin. It's a Jewish coin. And they say, now where does this go if you know so darn much about God? It's an impossible question. They were trying to trap Jesus. And as you know very well, Jesus is not to be trapped. He was never the one in trouble. Remember the woman caught in adultery? And all the men are getting their curveballs ready because the Torah says you stone that person until she is good and dead. And Jesus says, that's fine, that's fair. Standing right next to her, by the way. That's fair, that's fine. Whoever's living the perfect life, and we all know, by the way, because we know each other, why don't you throw that stone first? And then we'll talk about you. Everybody remember that? How many stones got thrown? Yeah, even men can think like that in a moment that maybe they should reconsider. Again and again, Jesus would turn. We don't trap him. He catches us. And so Jesus takes his coin from these people. They got it. There's nothing he can say. And Jesus looks at this coin and he says, Okay, so you give to Caesar what belongs to the emperor. By the way, the tax in that time was about 70% in a subsistence economy, what you earned. That, that's a very dramatic statement for Jesus to say. He says, give to Caesar what belongs to the emperor. But make sure you give to God everything that belongs to God. Please don't settle for the most predictably boring sermon about this passage in the world. That's the easy sermon. Well, what belongs to Caesar? Let's think about that. What belongs to God? Well, you know, I pray when I'm in trouble, when I'm driving through cones, I pray. When my college team is about to lose with four seconds left last night at 10.05, I pray. You know, Julius Thomas dragging in the back of the end zone there, I'll pray for Peyton. Yeah, okay, I got that. Okay, my spouse hasn't talked to me in two months, so I might pray about that. Yeah, okay. You know? Stock market's going up and Jesus says, you know, you keep the coin. <laughs> Jesus says, well, all in. That's not the right sermon. The right sermon is to say, we all belong to God. Everything we are belongs to God. Those earliest Christians took the two names you may know for extra historical bonus points. The two names they called the Roman Emperor by law in the late first century, you may know. Lord and Savior. You had to address the Roman Emperor with those titles. The earliest Christians in Matthew's time took those titles off the Emperor and applied them to Jesus. No more could anybody call the Emperor Lord and Savior. It was only Jesus. The more I think about it, the more I realize what in our lives doesn't belong to God already. He's got us. He's got who we are. He's got the heartbeat you woke up with. He's got everything you'll ever earn, every hope you ever had, every dream that's come true or not come true. He's got it all. Jesus was saying, all in. Remember that sermon about playing poker, like theological poker? Remember the guys in the World Series of Poker? They don't know what the other guy has in his cards or woman, but they push all their chips into the table. Remember that? It's kind of a all-or-nothing strategy. And it's called going all in. Jesus is holding up this coin, and they can't believe what he's just said. He's basically said to them, hey, come all in for God, or don't bother. Christian men don't make it. Can you feel the hands of that loving, kind, wise priest around the shoulders this morning. Thank you for standing up to God, for God. They don't know how much God stands up for us. Friends, it's a time to go all in. It's a time to think about how much we depend on God's grace, His mercy, and His favor every moment, all the time. No halfway, no Christianette. That's
that's not going to make it. We're not in a Christendom world. We're not in a post-Christendom world. Increasingly, they just don't know. They really don't. May I close with an image? It's a little tricky to do this because it's an, an email. Do you know the joke? I always think about the joke this time of year when I'm watching TV. How do you know that a politician is lying? You may know the answer. Their lips are moving. Yeah, okay. So uh, alongside of that is, do you trust anything on the internet? I was sent an email by someone um, who had a, a, a narrative of a survivor of ISIS taking over a village in Iraq, in northern Iraq. And in this village, there were Christian missionaries. So the ISIS fighters come to the door, and this is a really sensitive interfaith conversation. Give us all your money, or convert to Islam, or die. No welcome cards. No pledge drops. So, the story is, I have no way to refute this, by the way, is that the children met the ISIS fighters at the door of these missionaries. And they said, yes, we are Christian." And they were executed on the spot. This is the world that we are living in now. This is a time to consider that coin, whatever it looks like for us. And Jesus asks, what belongs to neighbor again? What really belongs to God? Can you feel the arms of a loving Lord right around the shoulders? Lifting us up, saying today, thank you for standing up for God. What they don't know is how much God stands up for us. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.